Hey guys, welcome back to another RC Glider Basics video. My name is Thomas Lee and today we're taking a look at the tail linkages on DLGs. If you've been flying DLGs for the past several years, then you're already likely familiar with the pole string setup. If you're new to DLGs, then this might be something new for you, even if you've been flying other types of RC planes in the past. In today's video, I'll explain what is a pole string tail linkage on a DLG, what are the traits we're looking for in a good linkage setup for tails, what the three main types of linkages for tails are, and at the end of the video, I'll answer some of the common questions I've seen regarding the pole string setup. If you enjoy this, please remember to hit like, subscribe, and press the notification bell icon. It only takes a second for you, but that's how the YouTube algorithm knows people are enjoying this video and finding it useful, so that they can make it more visible to others who are also interested in RC gliders as well. Thank you. So what is a pole string install? Basically, a torsion spring is installed in the tail, which will constantly deflect the control surface in one direction, and a string runs from the control horn to the servo, pulling it in the opposite direction. The tension in the string determines the deflection. This is the de facto linkage design used in pretty much all DLGs for the past several years, and that's because it takes all the right boxes. So what boxes are we trying to take? What is the definition of a good tail linkage? There's a lot of different details and considerations, but at the end of the day, I'd say that the linkage has to be light and accurate. On any RC glider, the masses at the extremities, like the wingtips and the tails, must be kept as light as possible to keep the model agile and able to indicate the air properly. Now on a DLG, this is even more important because of the launch. Heavier extremities means more rotational inertia that must be dampened so that it'll go straight during the launch. The heavier the extremities, the higher the rotational inertia, the more energy is wasted in dampening and the lower it'll launch. Also, DOGs are very high performance models and even a little bit of inaccuracy in the tail surfaces will lead to inconsistent setups. Now, these are three main causes for inaccuracy. The first being that there could be slop in the system that allows the surface to move even if the servo is still. Slop can come from a loose gear train in the servo, poor fitment between the pushrod and servo arm or control horn, and soft pushrods that bend along its length. Now, the second cause of inaccuracy is friction within the system that causes the linkage to double center. And thirdly, a low performance servo that isn't able to center properly will also lead to double centering. I've been using KST servos for many years now, and I am a KST team pilot. And they're the most popular servo brand for DLGs for good reason. Now there are three V6 servos that will work very well on DLG tails. The trusty X08, which has been in use for several years now, the brand new and even higher performance A08, which is shorter, lighter, and more accurate, as well as the tiny X06, which is as small and light as it gets. All of these are available from armstore.com with worldwide shipping, and for orders over $50, there is free shipping inside the US. Okay, so throughout the years, there has been three main types of linkages for tails on a DLG. For many years, push rods were used for tails just like the wings. And push rods are still used for most of the RC planes on the market right now. A properly installed tail push rod on a DLG is usually either a carbon rod or stainless steel wire that is fully supported inside a perfectly sized and matched etched Teflon tube that is glued in the entire length inside the boom. Now the pros of a good push rod install is a solid and reliable linkage that holds the control surface steady in both directions and has the least amount of wear and tear on the hinge line amongst the three install types. However, etched Teflon tubing is hard to source. The installation process is more difficult to properly do, which often leads to subpar installs. There will be slop in the system, especially as the servos develop slop over time under use. It's much more susceptible to trim changes due to thermal expansion if you are using a metal push rod and a killer. It is very heavy. A push rod install will typically add two to three grams to the tail, which increases the glider's all up weight by eight grams or more, most of which is at the extremities and tail and the nose. This has a rather poor effect on the glider's handling and performance. The second type is a pole pole system, which was used in several gliders. Now within the pole pole concept, there are two ways it can be executed. The first way has two strings that connects the servo arms to two control horns on the tail surface. This means one string is always in tension to hold the position, allowing for similar positive control in both directions like a push rod install, but at a lighter weight. However, it is even more difficult to have a properly centering setup with this type of pole pole install as you'll need to have both strings under very high tension. However, this leads to accelerated wear and tear on the tail hinges, 
which will cause damage and reduce centering accuracy as it ages, which will age very quickly. The second way pole pole installs are implemented is by installing a pulley system in a tail which connects to the servo by two strings on one side and connects to the tail surfaces via push rods on the other side. This moves the forces from the hinge line to the pulley, helping prevent the accelerated hinge wear and tear in the first pole pole system. However, this system still doesn't remove servo gear train slop and because of the additional pulley mechanics in the tail, it's not a big weight savings compared to a good push rod install. This brings us to the third pole string setup. I already went through how it works earlier in the video, but the major pros of the system is that it is extremely light, saving eight grams or more compared to a push rod install. There's zero slop in the system as any slop in the gear train or linkage is eliminated by the spring tension. And maybe just as importantly, it is incredibly easy to install properly. The downside to pole string is that only one side of the surface deflection is positive and under tension, while the other side is held in place only by the tension of the spring, which in some extreme situations can be overpowered. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in the video. The second downside is the constant tension against the servo, which means the servos will drain more power from the battery compared to a push rod or pole pole setup. Luckily, the downsides are pretty minor, while the upsides are significant, and so pole strength has become the go-to linkage for DLG tails. Now with the basics out of the way, let's answer some of the common questions I've seen regarding pole string installs. So first question, which side should the rudder control horn be installed? Okay, so the rudder horn should be installed on the opposite side of your throwing blade. For example, I'm a right-handed pilot, so my throwing blade is on the left wing and the control horn would be on the other side, on the right side. This means the rudder is under tension during the launch. And if you had it the other way, the forces of the launch rotation will push against and overpower the spring. This leads to significantly less efficient yaw dampening and much lower launch heights as a result. Okay, next question. Is it better to have the stabilizer on top or bottom for pole string installs? Okay, putting aside aerodynamic arguments, in the context of a pole string install, it is better to have it on the bottom so that the up elevator preset on launch is under line tension. If the stabilizer is on top, that means the forces are only pushing against the spring on launch, which again can lead to blowback for very hard launchers. Okay, next question. After powering off the glider, the spring and control surface overpowers the servo and moves the servo arm. Is that okay? Yes, it's actually not a problem at all. Actually, most of my planes are stored with the surfaces relaxed and not in the neutral position. Next question. Is it better to have a stronger or lighter spring? Now, I personally prefer have too much tension versus not enough tension as long as the servos can take it. It reduces the chance of blowback on high speed during the launch. The tension is determined by the diameter wire you use as well as the length of the center torsion section. Personally, I use a 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire and a 60 millimeter center torsion section. Next question. Can I use pole string on a bigger glider? Absolutely, yes. I've seen them used successfully on thermal gliders up to two meter wingspans, such as on F3 RES gliders. I've also seen them used on bigger models like four meter F5J models, but I don't think they did very well in that application. Push rods are probably the way to go there. Next question. Do I need to use a servo pulley or servo arm? Okay, if you've watched my build videos, you'll notice I'm using a pulley instead of a regular servo arm on my installs. It's not a must have, but it's certainly a nice to have. The pulleys will give you mechanical expo on the installation. That means at the center or neutral position, there is a lot of torque and higher accuracy. And at the ends of the travel range, you will train off a little bit of torque for bigger deflections. We make and sell these, I'll link them below as well. And last question for the day, what material should I use for the pole string? In the beginning, most people were using either Kevlar thread or fishing line like spider wire. Uh, they do have some stretch in it, so we took to hanging weights on the line overnight before installation. But if you have it in your plane for a longer period of time, you'll still exhibit some stretching. The popular wire material right now is a multi-strand fishing or beading wire, such as the Beadalon 0.015 inch 49 strand wire. And I'll have that link down below as well. It's reliable, doesn't stretch, and resistant to fatigue. Okay, well, I think that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it and got a better understanding of the pole string setup on DLGs. As usual, remember to hit like and subscribe. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you in our next episode.